We have a, a special guest this morning, and it's an honor to have him. Uh, I, the Bible says you show honor where honor is due. And for several months, uh, Pastor Leach drove down from, I, I guess here I'm not supposed to say that name, the state up north, I guess is how you're supposed, supposed to refer to it. But he drove down and uh, shared his heart every week. Uh, while we were looking for a pastor, and uh, I thought, and the board thought, it was uh, due time that we had him come back one more time and say thank you and honor him for the hours of drive time and the hours of preparation and the time he spent pouring into our lives. So would you join me? Let's welcome Pastor Leach as he uh, shares with us this morning. Morning. It is a thank you. It's a high honor for Marilyn and me to be uh, back with you here in Wapak. We uh, are so excited, so excited about what God has been doing in your midst, and uh, what an uh, honor for us to be able to come back one more time. And thank you for the privilege we had of journeying with you during your search. And uh, I can't tell you how delighted we are at your selection. Pastor and Chase and your disciples, uh, what great, what a great family this is! And we've been following. Marilyn's been following a little bit on Facebook. I don't. Uh, I go on Facebook uh, occasionally to to um, uh, anybody that says they want to be my friend. I'm a friendly guy and say okay. Although lately, I think that seems to be dangerous at the moment to uh, <laughs> to do, to do that. Excuse me while I. But it seems dangerous at the moment to do that, so if I ever send you a friend request, don't ever accept it, because I don't think I've ever sent, well, I've sent a few maybe here and there, but uh, don't accept any friend requests now, apparently. This is a public service announcement at this moment, but uh, anyway, I'm sure you've had infinitum, had a million people tell you not to accept them as a friend, so I don't know what all that means, but... Uh, Anyway, it's so good to be back in Wapak and to see the house of God filled and to sense the presence of the Lord and see so many faces that we've grown to love and appreciate and want you to know that our time here will long live in our memory banks and we pray for you regularly and uh, I know God is answering our prayers and yours and doing so many wonderful things. It's great to hear about the things coming up and, and the missions convention coming up, your missions week. Wow, what, a, what an incredible project of raising $5,000 for Teen Challenge. I, I believe in Teen Challenge, love that ministry. It is an incredible ministry. Uh, let me uh, just give a little uh, story that has nothing to do with the message, so please don't start the clock yet, but maybe to inspire you a little bit in terms of missions. I remember back in Adrian when we were planning our first ever missions convention, and um, I was concerned because we were also needing to build on our uh, 50 acres that the Lord had given us uh, at the edge of town, and um, we desperately needed to build, and we were in a catch-22 because uh, the money we could afford to spend wouldn't build a big enough building big enough uh, to handle what we needed and what we needed to build we couldn't afford, and... Uh, and we had finally, we had done a lot of preparation and we'd raised money and we far, finally borrowed money and we were launching our, getting ready to launch our building program. And I remember my concern, we had always been a missions church, but it had been part of our budget. And for the first time, we were going to do a missions convention and encourage people to make faith promises. And I remember praying and saying, Lord, help us as a congregation to really take a step of faith in missions and not, not be overly concerned with the huge uh, the huge need we had to uh, relocate and build the building that we needed to build. And uh, we had Bernard Johnson uh, that week back years ago. Some of you may remember him. He was called the Billy Graham of Brazil. Uh, he would fill stadiums and, uh, and thousands and thousands of people would come to Christ. And he was a great preacher and a great storyteller. And we had him for a week. And at the end of that phenomenal week, 
our people pledged by faith $25,000 to World Missions. Now, this was back uh, probably 45 years ago. That was a lot of money for our church in that day. And I was so excited. I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, you answered our prayers, and we took a step of faith. And that next week, I was uh, going to the mailbox and bringing the mail, and we don't hardly get mail anymore these days. It's all uh, by uh, other means. But I was flipping through the envelopes, and there was an envelope. I thought, I wonder what this is. Went in the office, slid it open, and pulled it out, and uh, there was a letter and a check inside. It came from a source not connected to our church at all, totally unexpected, but we got in the mail a check for $50,000 for our building program. And uh, God taught me and has taught me throughout the years that if we care about what he cares about, he'll care about what we care about. If we invest in his kingdom, he'll take care of us. And I can tell you it's been a source of miracles for our family through the years. Uh, For many, many, many years, our biggest monthly payment was our missions commitment. Uh, Bigger than our house payment, bigger than our car payment, bigger than the education of our kids in Christian school. We wanted our biggest investments to be in the kingdom of God. And I can tell you that God has poured and showered the blessings uh, through those years. And one of the blessings was the privilege we had of journeying with you. I think we were here, I don't remember, maybe about eight months, something like that. And what a wonderful time that was for Marilyn and me. We love you and uh, so thankful to be back. And uh, we're cheering you on, Pastor Jason and your family. We, we're proud of you. you. know God's called you here and great things are Uh, Great things are in store. Several have asked what we've been doing. Uh, Actually, I don't know, I can't tell you how it's happened, but uh, virtually every Sunday has filled for us. I've either preached a couple Sundays, we were at a wedding, and then uh, part of the 75th anniversary at Bethany, I preached one week and went back the next week when our general superintendent, Doug Clay, was speaking to uh, be a part of that day. And we've got the next several weeks uh, planned, and uh, in November I'm teaching a class uh, you can uh, pray for me because it'll be a suffering situation, but I'm preaching a class for two weeks in Nassau, Bahamas uh, on, uh, on managing church conflict. You can all say, oh, you know, and, and then after that, who knows? We're praying that God will open another door for kind of another short-term, long-term, intermediate, you know, assignment uh, with a, a church like like yours, so waiting for that uh, opportunity to happen. But anyway, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 16. Uh, Service today will be slightly different than out of the norm, perhaps. I want to talk to you on the subject, when the roll is called down here. Some of you will remember that old hymn, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. We're going to talk about when the roll is called down here, Romans chapter 16. Paul writes, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon at the, of the church of Sancria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been a benefactor of many people, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend Eponidas, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my fellow Jews, who, uh, who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Statius. Greet Apelles, whose fidelity to Christ has stood the the test. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew. Greet those in the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegion, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the other brothers and sisters with them. Greet Philologist, Julia, Nurse, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the Lord's people who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send 
Greetings, and may the Lord add his blessing to his word today. I wonder what emotions were cascading through Paul's spirit as he wrote Romans 16. I suspect your heart wasn't all a flutter as we uh, read these verses. I doubt on the way to church today you nudged your husband and said, Honey, I sure hope he preaches from Romans 16 today. You know, I've been, I've been studying that passage and, and just, des- just, just desiring to glean the deep theological truths, you know, from their mission. You know, we get to a passage like this, boy, we zoom, boy, I read the word today. You know, we get through these lists and, uh, and uh, wonder what, uh, what's Paul's purpose? Why did the Holy Spirit include this as part of the inspired Word of God? If all Scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, instruction, and right, where's the profit in a passage like this? One logical question is, who are these people, and, and how did Paul know them since he had never been to the church at Rome? I wonder if you could buy a mailing list back then. Part of the purpose of Paul's letter is to raise money for his mission trip to Spain. He says, I want to come to Rome because I really want to go to Spain, and I'm hoping that you'll help me along the way. I, I wonder if this is one reason why Paul is saying hello to all these people. You know, the role does give us some profile of the membership of this church. In the list, we have a husband and a wife, Aquila and Priscilla. I've never been quite sure who the husband and who the wife was in that mix, but they're there. There's a man and his mother, Rufus and his mother. There's a brother and sister, Norris and his sister. There are brothers, Andronicus and Junius, sisters, Tryphena and Tryphosa. There's an old man, Eponidas. Isn't that an interesting profile of the church? There's a single woman, Mary. A single man, Herodian, not a lot of nuclear family, not a lot of mom and dad and 2.2 children and a cat and a Ford Windstar, but, but Christ had called them together. It's, it's an interesting list, sort of. Well, maybe, maybe not. But for Paul, it's not a list. He's packing his stuff. He's in the home of Gaius in Corinth, who is host to Paul, and host to the church in Corinth. He's getting ready to go west to Italy and to Spain. He's moving to a new church far away, and and he's excited. He's maybe 59 or 60 years old, we're told, and he feels like he has one more good ministry shot in him. Now, I've helped pastors find churches, and churches find pastors for a lot of years, and I can tell you that a lot of churches today are not looking for somebody to come and pastor who's maybe 59 or 60 years old. You know, everybody wants somebody that's 20 years old with 30 years of experience, you know, somebody that's... uh, Somebody that has a good sense of humor but is very serious. You know, somebody's visiting all the time and spends all of his time in the office studying and, and those kinds of things. And, uh, but in Paul's case, nobody had a choice because he just showed up. I mean, he wasn't invited. He showed up. And everywhere he came, there was either a revival or a riot or a mixture of the two. But everywhere he went, he started his own. Uh, Paul got a late start. He was probably maybe 35 when he started and. And so he's excited. He's got, he's got at least one more opportunity in him. He doesn't have a lot to pack, his coat and books, a few other things. And while he's throwing things away to trim down the load for packing and moving, he comes across some notes and correspondence, and, and he begins to remember. So don't call it, don't call it a list. Aquila and Priscilla... They, they risked their necks for me. Andronicus and Junius, we were in jail together. <laughs> what great friends and great Christians. And there's Mary. You know, she worked hard. She, she was there when everybody else quit. She said, now, Paul, you go on home. I'll, I'll straighten up, you know, I'll straighten up the chairs and put the quarterlies away and, and throw away the chair. You go on home, Paul. No, Mary, you're, you're tired. You worked. No, Paul, you, you, you go on home. I'll straighten up. Well, Mary, you're tired too. Yeah, Paul, but you've got to ride a donkey halfway across Asia tomorrow. Now, you go on home. I'll, I'll take care of it. Mary worked hard. Then there's Eponidas, the first person 
converted under my preaching. What a night. I, I was awake all night long saying, thank you, Lord. Finally, somebody heard. Finally, somebody's eyes were open. Finally, somebody's heart was unlocked to see the majesty and the glory of the, of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. I didn't sleep a wink all night long. I was so excited. Tryphena and Tryphosa, obviously twins. You can hear it in, your, in their name, can't you? They, they sat right over here and they dressed just alike, and I never could tell who was Tryphena and who was Tryphosa. And Rufus, tell Rufus hello and tell his mother hello because she's my mother too. You know, some woman earned from this apostle the title mother. You know, can't you see her? He, he undoubtedly stayed in her home, and there was flour everywhere, and boy, she was a mean cook. And, and I, can, I can just visualize it now. You know, he gets up in the morning and says, I, I got to run. I'm running late. He says, no, Paul, sit down and eat your breakfast. I don't have time for I don't care who you are. Even apostles have to eat. Now sit down and eat your breakfast. Tell my mother hello. This, this is not a list. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to uh, scratch something off my bucket list, something I've, I'd wanted to do for a long time, and that was to visit the Vietnam Memorial. You know, that wall with thousands of names inscribed. And I suppose some people casually walk by and see it as just a list of a lot of names of people that they never knew. You know, the day I, the day I was there, there were artifacts placed on the ground at the wall under somebody's, obviously under somebody's name, an old baseball glove with a picture of a strapping teenager, flowers. Can't you picture today a grandmother holding a grandbaby and putting that finger in the imprint of a name? I graduated from high school at the height of the Vietnam War. Some of some of my friends' names are on that wall. It's not a list. Don't, don't call it a list. In fact, those names for Paul in Romans 16 are extremely special because even though he says hello, it may be goodbye. He says he's going to Rome, but first he's going to Jerusalem. He's going with the offering, and, and he knows through prophetic utterances that he's going into a hornet's nest of hostility. So at the end of chapter 15, he says to these people, pray with me. The word is sunogonizomai, agonize with me. Pray that, pray that they'll accept the money in Jerusalem. Pray that I'll come back and be with you. Please pray for me. These are not just names. It's not a list. Some time ago, I was cleaning out an old, uh, cleaning out a file drawer in my study office and I came across an old pictorial directory of uh, Bethany Assembly of God in Adrian where Marilyn and I were privileged to be associated with that great church for 17 years. And I sat at my desk and I began to leaf through and look at pictures and, and my mind and heart was flooded with memories. And, and I and I thought of the words of Paul that you read sometimes in some of his letters where he'll say something like, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Marilyn and I arrived, Marilyn and I arrived in Adrian at the invitation of the senior pastor, Brother Arthur Clay, to serve on his team as youth pastors. I've told a little of my story here, so I won't belabor it today, but come from a very dysfunctional background. My father was schizophrenic, paranoid, a violent man. Uh, my mother struggled, struggled to raise three boys in the inner city in Schenectady, New York, but a local church rescued us, and um, we went to camp in the summer, and I felt a call to ministry and went to Central Bible College. And at my, my freshman year, the director of Detroit Teen Challenge came to CBC looking for students to go to Detroit for the summer, and in that chapel service, uh, God gripped my heart, and I knew I was supposed to do that, and spent the summer of 68 at Detroit Teen Challenge. And when I graduated from CBC in 71, the only person I had any connection to at all, it was a very arm's length, was uh, the director of Detroit Teen Challenge because of that summer, Herb Meppelink. He invited me to come on his staff, and 
I went to, Meryl and I moved to Detroit thinking we were going to start a coffee house ministry that would become a new church plant, only Detroit Teen Challenge never went ahead with that. And I was, we were there, but not sure why we were there. But one Sunday I preached in Adrian for Teen Challenge, and the pastor, Arthur Clay, was looking for a youth pastor, and he contacted me after that and said that God had spoken to him, that uh, I was the one that God was calling to join his team. And we did that. We moved there right after, right after Thanksgiving, November 1971, just a few months out of, few months out of Bible school. On February 2nd, 1972, Brother Clay experienced a fatal heart attack, and um, we mourned and grieved with our church and stepped in and did all that we could in the interim, and finally that church took a monumental chance and invited us to be their pastors. Brother Clay was a great pastor. He, uh, he was a phenomenal preacher, an incredible communicator, and he loved people. He had this warm, winsome, outgoing, loving, personable uh, personality. You know, he'd walk into the room and the whole room would light up. Everybody felt better just being there with him. And he not only pastored Bethany Assembly, but he pastored Adrian in Lenaway County. I mean, every, it seemed like everybody in the county knew him, and, and he just loved people. And he, he, had built a, he had built a phenomenal church. It was the third largest church in Michigan in, in terms of Assemblies of God at that time. It's among the top 50 Sunday schools. I can't describe the shock that Marilyn and I felt when Brother Clay suddenly died because he, be, he became in my life the second real father figure I'd ever had. The first was my basketball coach at CBC, Coach Arnold, and I loved that man. And then, and then Brother Clay was really the second man that I had ever personally felt close to. And, and after two months, he was just snatched away just in a moment. Again, Marilyn and I served unofficially as interim pastors for several months. And, and as I said, that, take, that great church took a monumental chance and invited us to become their pastors. I was young, green, inexperienced. As I said, I come from an extremely poor and difficult inner city background. I didn't have any great preaching skill. There was not a lot of administrative uh, capacity. I wasn't a scholar in school unless basketball is considered a subject. And then I, uh, I studied that as hard as I could. But um, those people loved us. They were patient with us. Uh, they laughed or pretended to laugh at least at my uh, stupid jokes. And, um, and they, they frankly made Marilyn and me who we were, who, who we are, who I am. Uh, if in those days you would have looked in the dictionary under young, green, inexperienced, pray, church, pray, we're in trouble now, you know, would have had my picture. But that church, as I said, they loved us and supported us. To give you some sense of those early days, uh, uh, when, just before Brother Clay, I'd never been to a funeral in my life when I got to Adrian. I, again, young family, and we didn't, you know, really have a lot of family, never knew anybody on my father's side of the family, and my mother was young, I was young, I'd never really been close enough to anybody that had died to have a reason to uh, go to a funeral, and Brother Clay was going to a funeral just a week or two before he died, and going to preach when he asked if I'd like to come along, and I said, yeah, that'd be kind of fun, you know, I'd never been to one of those, and I'm a pastor, you ought to at least see one, and, and so I went, I went to the funeral, and <clears throat> sat in the back of Braun Funeral Home, little funeral home, sat in the back while Brother Clay preached, and what a great preacher he was, and he loved people, and it was awesome. And then Brother Clay died, and of course I went to his funeral, but I discovered, you know, it's not one that you could pattern a lot after because, uh, you know, the general superintendent doesn't fly in from Springfield for every funeral, and the executive director of foreign missions doesn't come, and the district superintendent, all the presbyters, you know, all these ministers don't show up every week when you need them for something like that. And so I watched his funeral, but again, uh, you know, it's not one that I could uh, mimic, certainly. And then somebody died in the church, and they asked me to do the funeral. I thought, oh, no, what am I going to do now? And so I went back to my notes from Bible college. You know, I'm a pastor. We know these things. And I went back to my notes. I have no idea where I was when that class was going on. Clearly, I was not fully. I, my body was in class, but my mind was someplace else. But I had, I had taken one strategic note. There was one thing I knew about funerals. I took one note for the whole class, and it was simply this, don't stand too near the hole. <laughs> and I didn't. You don't get by the hole. I know that. You stay away from the hole. I'm a pastor. You stay away from the hole. 
It's a good thing that Brother Clay was a manuscript preacher. I got the sermon he had preached a couple weeks before. I preached it word for word. You could die now. I got a funeral. I got a message. I'm all set. I'm ready to, I'm ready to go. You know, I'll never forget those early, wonderful early days. I was scrambling to preach, you know, three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, teach Sunday school, go to the hospitals, you know, all those, all those wonderful things we get to do. And, and I got a hold of this Salem Kerban book on prophecy. Now, I didn't know a thing about prophecy. I still don't know anything about prophecy. But when you're young, you don't have to know. I mean, you know everything when you're young, whether you know it or not. And, and I didn't know it, but I, I got a hold of this book, and I was staying one chapter ahead. And Wednesday nights, I planned this dramatic series on prophecy and I had us at the end of time, and the world was surrounding Israel because you probably don't know this, but the Dead Sea is a rich source of potash. You're probably surprised to know that. It's full of potash. And I was, I was waxing the elephant week after week about the potash in the Dead Sea and how many tons of acres, you know, how many acres this potash was going to fertilize and how much fruit this potash was going to produce. Week after week, I'm, I'm talking about this potash in the Dead Sea. And those people looked at me like some of you are looking at me this morning when I was talking about that. And, uh, and after one of those Wednesday night services, one of the farmers in our church, Kurt Parsons, came up to me and said, Pastor, are you sure that's not potash you're talking about? <laughs> uh, for, <clears throat> in those early days, I concluded every, every message with a salvation altar call. For two months, I'd watch Brother Clay preach, and again, he was an incredible preacher. And then he cast the net, and he'd invite people to find Jesus as Savior. And week after week, people would lift their hands and walk the aisles and commit their lives to Christ, and people would be saved and healed, miracles around the altars, filled with the Holy Spirit. It was wonderful. And I, so I figured that's what you do. And so I gave altar calls. The only difference was when Brother Clay gave altar calls, people lifted their hands. They walked the aisles. Things happened. When I gave altar calls, nothing happened. And this went on for several weeks, and I was discouraged, and I felt like it was a reflection on me. And when I look back at those sermons, I'm sure it was a reflection on me. What those poor people endured, you know, with me trying to struggle to preach uh, all those messages with very little... And so I quit giving altar calls. I decided, you know, it's better not to broadcast. This is not working. This is not working. You know, let people figure that out on their own without me, you know, just broadcasting it. And so, so I stopped giving altar calls. No, I didn't. I invited people to come to the altar. I didn't stop, you know, having people come and pray. But I stopped, I stopped casting the net and sharing the gospel and inviting people to respond and and that went on for a few weeks, and then one of our board members, Odell Lawler, came up to me after a service and looked me in the eye, and he said, Pastor, I noticed you haven't been giving an altar call lately. And I kind of mumbled something. You know, obviously it was true, yeah, or, you know, whatever. And I didn't tell him I was embarrassed. I didn't tell him I was ashamed. I didn't tell him that I just felt like it wasn't working. I just kind of mumbled something, and, and he didn't berate me. He didn't criticize me. He just... He was a loving guy, just a cheerleader for me, and he just looked me in the eye, and he just kind of grabbed my hand. He said, Pastor, please give altar calls. We need altar calls. And with that, he walked away. And I had enough theological sense in my thick cranium to know that I was never going to save anybody. I was never going to heal anybody. Nobody, no, no miracle was going to happen because I was a great preacher or a poor preacher. I knew in my heart that nobody comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws them. It's the Holy Spirit's job to, to convict and convince. And, and so I decided, I made a conscious decision in that moment that I was going to give altar calls whether anybody ever responded again or not. And I wish I could tell you a dramatic story that the next week, you know, 17 people got saved. I, I really don't remember it that way, honestly. But I can tell you that as I was faithful to do what I could do as I studied and prayed and came to the pulpit with whatever word I felt that God was giving me for our body for that day or that season. Little by little, people began to respond. And for 17 years, there were very rare 
weeks when somebody didn't lift a hand. People came to the altars. They confessed Christ as Savior. People were healed, filled with the Spirit around the altars. Because I was a great preacher? Oh, of course not. But because God honors His Word. God honors His Word. And I can tell you there were Wednesday nights when in Bible study, it was all home folk, I'd give the altar call just out of rote, routine, not expecting anything to happen, and somebody would lift a hand and say, I want to get saved. So you do? You know, I'd be shocked when that would happen. And why in that moment the Holy Spirit would unlock somebody's heart and draw them, I can't tell you, but I can tell you this, I thank my God upon every remembrance of Odell Lawler. That uh, pictorial directory represents hundreds of stories and relationships. I see the pictures of the Ackley family. Uh, Larry and Judy Ackley were motorcycle people, rough, tough. They own, still own, and operate the Harley Davidson uh, motorcycle shop in, in Adrian. Their son Dennis had a cancer on his throat, and God miraculously healed it. And I'll never forget the night that Larry Ackley knelt at my living room couch and wept his way through to a salvation experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. Merrill and I were back in Adrian for two Sundays in a row a few weeks ago. They were, they were just finished celebrating their 75th anniversary, and, and Judy Ackley was one of the people we got a chance to hug and talk to, and a few years ago she ran for state representative in Michigan uh, to represent that section of the of our state on the uh, state legislature. Um, wonderful miracles. There's Alan Bailey, another miracle of healing from cancer. He and his wife drove 35 miles one way from Ohio to go up north to our church. See the pictures of students uh, uh, who are now in ministry around the world, too many to number. I mean, there's scores and scores and scores of them. But people like Doug Clay, who is now our general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, Mary Bradshaw with her husband Steve uh, came on Bethany's staff and then planted a church in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, then became our home missions directors in Michigan, and now are, pa are pa pastoring a great church in Venice, uh, Florida. Todd and Toby Tidswell, youth pastors and then pastors in Michigan. Uh, Rick Noth serving at headquarters, uh, heading up the publications department. Uh, Doug Jenkins, who is wife, with his wife Bonnie, are professors at Central Bible College. Nate Ellerton, one of our presbyters, pastoring a great church in Bedford. Barry Makel, Wycliffe missionary. I could go on and on. Paul Burkhart, that you support in Alaska. I could go on and on talking about the, the teenagers that grew up and went off to serve God around the world, many of them. I see in the list Paul and Madeline Burkhart, and, and, and great people, great family. Um, and, and your missions convention week is coming up. Let me tell you a story about Paul and Madeline. When I think of Paul and Madeline, I think of, I think of Sunday school because Paul was our Sunday school superintendent forever, and I think of missions because Madeline head up our women's ministries group, women's WMCs in those days, and they love missions. They were a very modest family. They lived out in a small community outside of town of uh, uh, Palmyra, uh, that community has a very, very sketchy water table. Again, they were very mo five children, modest means, and uh, their well would dry up every summer. And every summer they'd have to eventually haul in water, and it was a, it was a real hardship for their family. The church was having a missionary from somewhere, I think, in Central America, and the missionary represented a Bible school that needed to drill a well. And the missionary talked about how the students had to carry water up this big hill and what a struggle it was. And, and Paul and Madeline were touched as they were touched whenever a missionary came. And they had been saving money to drill a new well for their home. And God spoke to them and told them to give that money to the missionary. And they did. They made a faith promise, I believe, beyond that to help drill that well because they, they knew what it was like to really have trouble having water. It was in the middle of summer or to late in summer when their well should have draw, been dried up a long time ago when Madeline was standing at the sink, kitchen sink, and water was gushing out of their pipes that she realized, we haven't had to buy water this year. We've had sufficient water. Do you know that God turned on their well 
And their well ran for the next uh, probably 30 plus years until a couple of years ago, Madeline and Paul had gone home to be with Jesus, and Madeline was aging, and the family needed to get her out of the house. And the only way they could get her out of the house was for God to turn off the water. And so finally, God turned off the water so they could get Madeline out of the house. And they learned, as we all learn, if we serve Jesus, that you can't outgive God. You care about what He cares about, He cares about what you care about. I see J.C. Cook, you know, Jay, Jay drove the bus. He was a tall, lanky guy, uh, served on the board for a while. Actually, J.C. and Bob Oliver, a little story about them. The church uh, bought a part. We were in one parsonage, and they bought another parsonage uh, that we moved into so our new associate could have a place to stay. And um, when they were getting the house ready for us to move in, the bathroom door had a hole in it. And so instead of putting on a new door, they put a little plaque on the door that, said, that covered the hole that said, Speak, Lord, your servant heareth. And so I've kidded them for years of what cheapskates they were, you know, as I had <laughs> But J.C., he, he was a, he, I don't think he tried to be funny, but I just laugh whenever I get around him. He's just so, just this dry sense of humor. But the thing I remember about J.C. and Ethel Cook were they were always there. They were always there. We could have a blizzard, you know, 17 people might show, J.C. and Ethel were always there in their place, supporting, encouraging I see Pete and Jane Clark, this picture of genuine intercessors. They love to pray. They love to pray for me. Odell and Curl Aller, I already talked about Odell. They were mom and dad to Marilyn and me. Whenever we'd go out of town, our dog Bruno loved to go to Lawler's house and be in the pen with their dogs. And we'd say, you want to go to Lawler's? And he'd start barking. And there's brother and sister Jackson. Brother Jackson was on my board, faithful, loyal. Uh, he was a great worshiper. I love to watch Brother Jackson worship. If, if I was down at all, or I'd look to Brother Jackson. He, you know, he, his hands raised, and there'd be a glow about him, and he'd be dancing and singing and praising. And you just knew he was not in Adrian anymore. I mean, he was in heaven. He was in heaven. His body might have been, but he was in heaven worshiping God. I'll never forget the year that Brother Jackson contracted cancer and. We prayed and we sought God and wanted so much for God to heal him. And toward the end, I wanted, went out to his house every day to pray for him. And God did heal him, but not in the way we were hoping. He took him home to heaven. And along with some of these other names I've mentioned, when I go back to Adrian, he and Odell and Curl and, and JC, and those people are not there anymore. They're in heaven, and I, I miss them. I can't tell you today how much I miss them. See the picture of Darwin and Mark Huckel. Uh, Mark's husband, Gary, another great friend and golf friend of mine, uh, died in a tragic car accident, young family. And then Darwin lost his wife uh, to cancer right within a short, very short time span of each other. At the time when uh, these two people lost their spouses, their son, the son and the daughter, were dating each other. And as God's plan would have it, not only did the son and the daughter end up marrying each other, but their mom and dad married each other too. And it's great because uh, there's no question where those kids are going at Christmas and Thanksgiving. <laughs> I mean, they are going home. <laughs> My kids didn't listen to me. I've told them both they had to marry orphans because I wasn't going to share when it came to but they didn't listen to me. You know, they, they <laughs> but, you know, the nice thing about that, you know, is that, though, that marriage better make it because there's no going home to mom and dad and saying, well, this isn't quite working out, you know. <laughs> it's true for mom and dad as well. There's no going back to the kids and saying, well, I don't think this is going to work, you know. <laughs> I think that's the way it ought to be in every home, don't you? There's uh, John and Emma Jenkins. Uh, they came to us from a non-Pentecostal background and plowed right in and positive, solid, loyal. They, they headed up and pioneered our... Uh, our evangelism explosion ministry, and for years they, they train people how to share their faith with other people, and so many people found Jesus as a result. See the pictures of Ken and Faye Martin. Ken was on my board, and <clears throat> we had a rule at the board. It wasn't really a written rule or anything per se, but we had a, a kind of an unwritten covenant with each other that, that in the board meeting we wanted everybody to express themselves. We wanted the different perspectives. We wanted people to share freely. 
Uh, but once we decided, we decided. And we went out in unity. Once, whatever it was, once, and most everything was consensus, everybody agreed. But occasionally, you know, there's a sense that people had different opinion. And on one occasion, we were raising money for something. I don't remember what it was, but isn't it wonderful we're always raising money? Isn't that great? I mean, really, the needs are always bigger than we are. There's always another challenge. There's always something else. We, it's awesome. And for the first time, we were going to do a capital campaign with a company to come in and kind of help us. It was something major. Again, I don't remember what it was. But, and every, everybody on the board thought we ought to do it except Ken. He didn't think we should do it. Now, he was for raising the money and for the project, but he didn't think we needed the uh, consultant to help us as Turned out, I think he was probably right. I think we could have done it without it. But, but be it as it may, we decided to do that. And I forgot, I totally forgot that Ken was opposed to it. And when we needed somebody to head up the campaign for our church, I asked Ken to do it. And uh, Ken was loyal and positive and generous and, and, and supportive and po- you know all those things. And was all said and done, he came and said, Pastor, you remember I didn't think we should do this. I said, Ken, I forgot. I totally, I totally forgot. I see in the directory, Emmett Oaks, another board member, my golf league partner. I see Bruce Webb, young guy I played basketball with in the City League. Bruce is now president of the Assemblies of God Financial Credit Union in Springfield, Missouri. There's Carol and Cheryl Rice, twins. I never could tell them apart until Carol came to work every day in our office. Or was that Cheryl? I'm not really sure. There's Dave and Carla McKelvey. Carla was our office manager, and Dave was uh, again on our board for a time and one of my best friends. See Florence Rogers' picture, and I remember her husband, Ray. Ray Rogers had a, a, a wooden leg. He had fingers missing off of both hands. He was completely deaf. He was in his early 70s, and uh, Ray Rogers was a tremendous golfer. And I loved to play golf with Ray Rogers on Monday, my day off, because he had a cart. And I could play all day long in his cart and not have to pay for the cart. You know, you paid, paid 18 holes of golf, and then I'd stay all day and ride around in this cart with him. And uh, the interesting thing about Ray was, uh, you know, he was there to play golf. I mean, he had no patience for slow play or anything in front of you. And so uh, he'd hit, you know, if a group in front of us was a little slow, and he decided he'd wait, waited long enough, he'd hit the ball. He'd hit it into him. I don't know what it is about it that people don't like it, you know, if you hit a golf ball, you know, toward Adam, but uh, people don't seem to like that. And he'd hit, and then he'd turn to me, and he'd yell, hit! He'd get this look on his face, like, hit! He'd scream, hit, hit! Well, what do you do when you're 22 years old and a 70-year-old man? You do what he says. You hit the ball. You don't argue. Besides which, you couldn't talk to him because he couldn't hear. And he, and he didn't do sign. He didn't have fingers. He didn't do sign language. You know, he, he could read lips a little bit. But you do what he says. When you're a kid, you do what the man says. And we get in the middle of some people that would be saying some rather colorful things. But Ray Rogers was dead, deaf as a doornail. He, he just played right on through, happy as a lark. You know, and I, my ears would get redder and redder and redder. <laughs> the thing about Ray Rogers was that Brother Clay baptized him and they forgot about his wooden leg. So when they put him under the water, this leg come flying up out of the baptismal tank. It was awesome. You should have been there. <laughs> 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 There's Esther Gebert and Ed Hanley, men who's, who had a ministry for taking care of my life and my house, anything, anything practical. God called me to preach because he knew I'd starve. He said, that boy can't do anything. Maybe he can talk. I better get him in the ministry, you know. And I remember when the washing machine went on the blink, you know, four-year-old Brad said to his mother, don't worry, Mom, I'll call Brother Hanley. We'll take care of it. <laughs> You know, it's not, I'll call dad. I'll call, I know what to do. I'll get the board member in here. We'll, we'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. Uh, four-year-old Brad used to love to sit in Papa Esther's lap and drive his truck around our little subdivision in Adrian. And Papa Esther would say, watch out for the cars, Brad. And Brad would say, you watch out for the cars, Papa Esther. I'm driving. <laughs> you know. Those men, uh, I'd whisper to Papa Esther that there's, my ox is in a ditch. That was code language that uh, I didn't want to mow my lawn. And uh, he'd show up with his big red truck and 
his trailer and he'd roll that big lawn tractor off and he'd mow my grass so that I could get on with the work of the ministry, you know, could get on with the things that were really critical. And uh, what am I trying to say? Those men love me. They love me. We look at Romans 16 and call it a list. Paul writes it and calls it the church. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul recounts a litany of hardships he suffered in the ministry. He talks about prisons and beatings and being exposed to death and lashes and all kinds of shipwrecked and on and on it goes. Sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, cold, dangers. But in the middle of all of that, he adds these words in verse 28. He says, besides everything else, I face, I face daily the pressures of my concern for all the churches. Pressures of my concern for the church. I suspect we can all at times identify with Paul. We know the statistics, or we perhaps don't, but of how a perilous ministry can be for ministers, discouraging at times, frustrating at times. We know the realities and dangers of burnout all of us in ministry or life know what it is at times to feel unappreciated and opposed. But if we're not careful, we can dwell on 2 Corinthians 11 and forget Romans 16. 2 Corinthians 11 is balanced by Romans 16. The, the pressures and sacrifices and problems of, the, uh, of life are balanced by the community and blessings and koinonia of the church. We can forget the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that is with us in the community we call the church. I heard about one 12-year-old boy who couldn't talk, at least as far as anybody knew. He'd never spoken before. But after having been served oatmeal several breakfasts in a row, one morning he blurted out and says, Yuck, I hate oatmeal. And his mother was overwhelmed, as you can imagine, if you had a 12-year-old who couldn't talk. We can't wait for him to walk and talk, so we tell him to shut up and sit down. I don't know, I don't know why that is. But, uh... And she rushed across the room, and she hugged him close, and she's sobbing, and then reality set in. And she pointed her finger and said, for 12 long years, your father and I were convinced you couldn't talk. How come you've never spoken to us before? Bluntly, he replied, up until now, everything's been okay. <laughs> and, you know, we laugh at that, but I suspect there's more truth to that than we'd like to own. When things are going well, we're silent. But when things go a little awry, we complain, and boy, can we complain. It's like the guy that came to his pastor said, Pastor, I have to complain because I have to do what I do best. Some people have the gift of that, don't they? If we're not careful, we can become that man. We can focus on 2 Corinthians 11 and bemoan the pressures and problems and needs and miss the community of Romans 16. There's something healthy for our souls when we are thankful. And we need to tell people on a regular basis that we appreciate them for their sakes and for ours. How many times do we read the Psalms and it talks about, bless the Lord. We sang it this morning. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Don't forget his benefits. Thank him. Praise him. How many, how many utterances, prophetic words have there been where God says, praise me, worship me? It's not because he needs it, because he doesn't need anything from us. It's because we only realize how great he is when we tell him and tell others how great. That completes us. That helps us to know the joy and the, and the excitement of how great he is by telling him that. And there's not only a need for us to tell God how great he is, but a need for us to tell each other how much we appreciate them. Because unlike God, we do need that. We need people to say, hey, I appreciate you. You bless me. You've impacted me. You've, you've made a difference in my life. 
What are the names on your list? Do you have a name or two? I hope while I was telling my stories, you were telling yours, because if not, the message doesn't connect with the intent. The intent isn't just to hear some stories from my life, but to begin to rehearse your own stories, people that have blessed you and loved you and impacted your life. For you, keep the list. Because for you, it's not a list. You might write the list down and others would pass by, and not, but for you, it's different. The next time you move, keep the list. Take it with you. I don't care if you have to leave your furniture, your car, your computer, your kids, whatever. <laughs> take the list. In fact, when your ministry has ended and you leave the earth, take the list. Oh, I know, I know. You get to the gate and St. Peter's there and he says, look, you came into the world with nothing. You're going to go out with nothing. What's that in your hand? And and you mumble, well, it's, you know, just, it's, you know, just some folks that, just some names. And you say, well, I want to see it. You say, well, you know, just some people that I, you know, I kind of worked with. They kind of, I want to see it. Well, well, frankly, it's just a, a group of people that if it weren't for them, I don't think I'd have made it. I want to see it. And finally, you hand it over and he smiles. And he says, oh, I know all of them. In fact, on the way here to the gate, I passed some of them. They were painting a great big sign to hang over the street that said, Welcome Home. Who are the names on the list? Some of them are in this room. How long has it been since you said, I appreciate you, you've made an impact? I'd like to close this message in a different way. Often we have an altar response. I want a response. I would like to have a a season of popcorn testimony. You know what popcorn testimony is? You pop up, turn white, fall down. (laughs) No, no, sorry. It's not quite what it is. But I want one of you after another to stand in your best preacher voice. You can do it real loud. I want you to look at somebody in this body, and I want you to name names. I know what we say, oh, I don't want to name. Forget all of that. I want you to name some names, or name or two. Again, brief, because we want to get a lot in. But I want you to say to them, I appreciate you because. You know, you prayed for me, you took me to church, you, you, whatever it is, you watched my, whatever it is. And I'm not looking, I appreciate the privilege of being here today, so please don't think that this, it doesn't work if you're, I'm not, I feel your appreciation, leaders feel your appreciation, you know, it's not about that, please, it's not about that. But I want to take maybe 10 minutes or so. We can get a lot in. Uh, if you'll just, but okay, who'll be first? Just jump up, look at somebody, or, and be real loud, and, and tell them you appreciate it.